Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. So let me tell you about Noah. Noah is a typical patient that I might see on any given day at our MGH program. Noah, who is the youngest of three, grew up in a loving home with a passion for baseball, guitar playing, building robots. He was bright, enthusiastic, had a ton of friends, and was quite the energetic child. He was also caring, sensitive, and always thinking about the feelings of others. Um, when he was very little, he refused to wear any shirts with tags, and for two years, he would only eat Burger King. When Noah turned 10, he began to jerk his head. Neither he nor his family understood why he did this or why he couldn't or wouldn't stop. Over the next six to 12 months, things got worse. His neck movements progressed to lip um, licking, loud sniffing, and jaw popping. Also, he needed everything to be even, and we'd have to tap until things felt just right. Noah couldn't sit still or focus, and he made impulsive, inappropriate comments that left him open to severe bullying. Ultimately, Noah had to leave school. Noah spent two years being misdiagnosed and misunderstood before he was finally given the correct diagnosis. Noah, which is not his real name, is actually my little brother. He's now an adult, has a master's in engineering, and works in a well-known toy company developing prototypes. Life certainly hasn't always been easy for him, but he's currently doing really well. Fast forward 20 years, and now I get to spend every day helping and working with kids like Noah and their families. I've long been fascinated by why we do what we do, what goes in or doesn't go in to the decisions that we make, and how certain factors, such as the experiences of those close to us, help shape our behaviors. I've also always been interested in how symptom patterns are identified and how one will see sets of symptoms that on the surface one wouldn't expect to go together, go together. These curiosities and personal experiences help shape my interests and propel me through medical school, psychiatric training, child psychiatry training, and then with mentorship and support from Mass General Psychiatry and collaborating neurologists, I am where I am today. And so today, I wanna to tell you more about our program and why we do what we do. Millions of children in the US are impacted by tic disorders, including Tourette syndrome, and OCD and related disorders. And with this, we often see a negative impact on self-esteem, academics, peer relationships, and family life. Our pediatric program at MGH is the only dedicated child psychiatry program to Tourette syndrome and related disorders in Massachusetts, and one of only a handful in the US. So when people hear obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, often their first thought is hand washing or needing to keep things organized. While those are certainly possibilities, in kids, the presentation is actually usually more commonly different. Many of the youth who come to us struggle with stuck, intrusive thoughts, things that they don't want to think about, but that they just can't get out of their heads. Or they may struggle with needing constant reassurance. For example, are you sure that's okay? Are you sure that you're sure? Are you sure that you're sure? Or what I like to call the but what ifs. Also, many struggle with elaborate rituals where they have to do something either to stop something else bad from happening or until it feels just right. By the time these youth get to us, their symptoms are not uncommonly taking hours a day, interfering with school, friends, and significantly impacting the family. Other conditions in the OCD family that we see include repetitive hair pulling or skin picking, where the child often wants to stop but can't, and body dysmorphic disorder, um, where there's excessive problematic focus on a specific body part. As I mentioned earlier, we also treat children and adolescents with tic disorders. So first, what are tics? They're brief, repetitive, non-purposeful movements or sounds that are somewhere between voluntary and involuntary, or as we say, involuntary. Like the feeling before having to scratch an itch, or before you sneeze, or before you yawn. Some tics are simple, like blinking, shrugging, or sniffing, and some are complex and appear more purposeful, like running one's hand through one's hair, certain bending movements, or having to say certain words or phrases. Tourette syndrome, which is a childhood onset neuropsychiatric disorder, is defined by having only two motor tics at least, and at least one vocal tic for at least a year. So now, 
With that said, 90% of individuals with Tourette syndrome have at least one co-occurring psychiatric disorder. So about two thirds of youth with Tourette syndrome will have either ADHD um, or OCD, and about a third will have all three. Often though, the symptoms don't fit as neatly into the buckets as they're supposed to, uh, making diagnosis and treatment a lot more difficult. I found this problem of these in-between symptoms and complex symptom patterns fascinating, and I became increasingly interested in helping these youth with these multiple co-occurring conditions and complex presentations. I began adapting my language to focus on what so many of these kids described. Uh, sorry. Uh, that they weren't doing something to stop something bad from happening. They were doing it because they had to. They described feeling like if they didn't, they were gonna explode. Parents whose children were experiencing this often reported explosive meltdowns and hours of the day lost because they were experiencing this um, need for just right. That particular symptom, which we often refer to as Tourettic OCD or tick-like OCD, reminded me of my brother, who would become fixated on something that he didn't want to buy, he needed to buy, or else he would explode. These were not the simple compulsions that we learned about in training. Taking it a step further, while leading a study looking at behavioral treatments tailored specifically for youth with tics and co-occurring ADHD, I noticed that many of the participants would describe having to do the thing they least wanted to do, and that doing so would ultimately be both satisfying and deeply upsetting. For example, powering off a video game just before they're about to beat a level, or pushing on a bruise, or in the middle of a swim meet, having to breathe in um, right before they're about to win. These behaviors, which we named intrusive destructive behaviors or IDBs, had properties of tics, intrusive thoughts, compulsivity, impulsivity, disinhibition, and hadn't previously been specifically characterized in the literature. Last year, after publishing and presenting on it nationally, patients from around the country reached out to me to say how validated they felt to be seen and know they're not alone, and that this is something for which they can seek help. And so, not infrequently, a parent will present with their child to our program and describe having received diagnoses of tics, OCD, hair pulling, skin picking, executive dysfunction, ADHD, mood disorder, anxiety, rage, sensory hypersensitivity, learning differences, and social struggles. It is really hard. So I'm often asked, why do we see all of these symptoms and syndromes together? And perhaps we are missing something because how could one child have so many diagnoses? Well, there is a reason that we see all these syndromes and symptoms together. It's because they all are indeed connected through their association with this frontal cortical striatal thalamal cortical or CST circuitry. What's so interesting about this circuit is that it's in charge of regulation, meaning that when it's functioning the way it should, it helps regulate one's movements, attention, emotion, but when it's not, one sees dysregulation and disinhibition. In the kids that we see, it's not that they can't concentrate, it's that they can't regulate concentration. It's not that they necessarily have a mood disorder per se, it's that they can't regulate um, their mood um, and will have you know, very big emotions. Uh, so with parents, I often like to say that their kids feel strongly. And so for parents, I ultimately explain while, that while there are multiple diagnoses listed on paper, it's really one underlying circuitry problem that's manifesting in all these multiple domains. However, to you know, Dr. Campadone's point, the state of the art currently in our treatments is that despite all of these being connected, we currently require different treatments for the different diagnoses. And so given that, I'm often asked, where do you start? Well, let me tell you about Cooper. Cooper's name and some small details are changed, but mom recently gave me permission to share his success story. Cooper, a sweet, sensitive, artistic young boy, first came to me in the third grade. He had frequent bothersome neck and eye tics, OCD symptoms where he couldn't say um, or um, write certain numbers or words, and um, he was also reassurance seeking for hours a day. His teachers reported that despite his aptitude, he was almost two years behind in reading and math as he simply couldn't focus. He also had explosive episodes and trouble sleeping. Parents had tried everything they could, nutritional changes, exercise, supplements, but ultimately they came in as the struggles were just too intense, though they were still understandably very nervous about medication. 
In situations like this, we start by asking, what is most bothersome and impairing to the patient? Cooper found his tics extremely frustrating and upsetting. And so we started by addressing those with a very low dose of an alpha agonist, clonidine uh, blood pressure medicine. We also connected Cooper with MGH behavioral therapy expert and got him into neuropsychological testing. The medicine helped and his tics dramatically improved. Six months later, it became increasingly clear the degree to which Cooper's ADHD symptoms were impairing his functioning. We spoke about certain medications, such as stimulants and alpha agonists, are shown to be synergistic in kids with Cooper's profile, and that stimulants are safe to take for ADHD, even in those that have tics. We ultimately started a low dose of a stimulant, and Cooper did great. And Cooper and this regimen we maintained for a year. However, over time, despite working so hard in therapy, um, Cooper's OCD was just too difficult. Um, shortly before our last visit, mom reached out and said, I think we're at the point where we want to try that medication for OCD. We had previously spoken about this as an option at a previous appointment. Mom said that Cooper came to her the other day and said, please, mom, there has to be something else I can try to help with this. The therapy was helping, but just not enough. We ultimately started 10 milligrams of fluoxetine or Prozac. And when I saw them one month ago and I asked how things are, mom's eyes started welling up and Cooper, one who's typically a man of few words said, I'm amazing. This is the best I have ever felt. And, um, and that was when mom actually suggested that I share the story of his journey uh, and the family's journey. And so putting it all together, another important takeaway is that the patient is more than just the child sitting in front of you. In order to provide the best care, you need to fold in the parents, the siblings, the school, the teacher. You need to listen to the patients and the families and their experiences. Treatment, especially for complex conditions that we see in our program, are not a one size fits all. The more we learn from our patients, the more we can research and develop the tools that can help. For example, published clinical research studies above that focus on the tailored approaches for these complex symptom profiles. It's an exceptionally exciting time for pediatric OCD and tic disorders as a field we're on the precipice of multiple new understandings and discoveries. Research in this area generally falls into three buckets. Patterns we see clinically, what exists beneath those patterns, genetics, neurocircuitry, microbiome, and what novel treatments can come from those findings, including the drive towards precision medicine. And so I think it's important to step back and acknowledge that in my role, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in psychology, psychiatry, neurology fields. As director of the Pediatric Psychiatry, OCD, and Tick Disorders program at Mass General, I'm proud to carry the torch forward. Ultimately, it's my mission and vision to build a comprehensive, coordinated, collaborative, and personalized one-stop shop for these patients and families affected by tick and OCD spectrum disorders, where a patient can present for initial evaluation with one of our psychiatrist clinicians and have the chance to work with a team of therapists, social workers, support groups, and have access to leading edge treatments and clinical research trials. And so this brings me back to where I started. I wish that this depth of information was available to my brother, my parents, and my family 20 years ago. And with help from my patients and collaboration with colleagues at Mass General, it's my mission and vision that we are soon in a place where we can look back at 2023 and say, I can't believe how much we've grown since then. Thank you. <laughs>